you can sit down. <laughs> Sign text for today is John's Gospel, the ninth chapter, and it's verses 1 through 41. I want you to pull out your worship Bible that's in front of you there, if you would. Look around, you may have to ask a neighbor for one. Turn to page 1074. It's a long Gospel reading, and it encompasses the whole story of Jesus healing the blind man and, and why and the outcome of that. So, read along uh, to yourselves as I read the scripture for you. As he went along, he saw a blind man, a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming, and no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And after saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seen. Now his neighbors and those who were formerly seeing him begging asked, Is this the same man who used to sit and beg? And some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he looks like the man. But he himself insisted, I am the man. And then, or how then, were your eyes open, they asked. And he replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud, put it on my eyes, and he told me to go to Siloam and wash. And so I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, he asked them. I don't know, he said. Well, they brought him. Uh, they brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. And now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was the Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. And some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? And so they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. And the man replied, he was a prophet. They still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one you say was blind, born blind? How is it that now he can see? Well, we know he is our son, the parents answered. And we know he was born blind. But how can he now see? Or who opened his eyes? We don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. And his parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, He is of age, ask him. Well, a second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. And he replied, Whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. The one thing I do know is that I was blind and now I see. Then they asked him, what, do, what did he do to you and how did he open your eyes? And he answered, I have told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Well, then they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. 
we know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. And the man answered, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this the reply, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Well, Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And then he went and found him. And he said, you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked, tell me so that I may believe in him. And Jesus said, you have seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. And the man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this, and asked, What? Are we blind too? And Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. The gospel of our Lord. Thank you. That's a long one, huh? Well, I thank you for sticking, it, uh, sticking with me on it and reading along within the Bible itself, or you can begin to see the whole picture of what was taking place uh, on that particular day. Let's pray. You know, Lord, as we go about our lives, there are probably many things that we do not see. There are things we close our eyes to, and Lord, there are just things that we miss. And when it comes to our spiritual lives, Lord, we are probably more often blind than we are able to see. And so today, we ask that you would heal us. You would open our eyes so that we might see you. And in seeing you have faith, and in having faith, share that good news with others. So bless this word today as we share it. Amen. Amen. Are there moments in your life where you have seen, uh, looked at things, and just not really seen what was there? Uh, where you know of something and you think, you know, it probably should be important or good for you, but you just can't see it. I mean, you're kind of we'd say blind to the facts of the matter, right? Anybody feel that way occasionally? Well, there's a few things like that in my life. Uh, for instance, um, art. Uh, I, I've never really thought of myself as a person who appreciates art. I look at something and I go, well, it's pretty, I suppose, and, you know. But having then uh, went over to Italy and walked through the various museums in Rome and elsewhere where you see these beautiful, famous pieces of art, artists over the centuries, you walk into the Sistine Chapel and you look up at the very top of the Sistine Chapel and you see these magnificent paintings that were painstakingly uh, painted up there over the years and now have lasted for hundreds of years. Uh, it's quite impressive. I never really understood it, but when I saw it, you know, my eyes were open, and I could appreciate it in a different way. Other things are like that, too. I mean, broccoli, for instance. I mean, as a kid, who likes green vegetables? My eyes were closed to broccoli. But then, you try it with a little cheese sauce. <laughs> You eat it uh, fresh, uh, you know, uh, off the grill uh, in the summertime. It's, it, it's actually quite good. My eyes were open to that. Country western music could be another illustration, except for I can't understand why it is still. Why I, it. I mean, I get the cowboy boots and the cool shirts and belts and stuff, but it's just not there. When I was younger and a teenager, I guess, it was 
it's about the Bible. Uh, it seemed to be this giant mystery for which my eyes were closed. And I really couldn't make much sense of it. It didn't seem like something of much interest at all. It seemed to have very little to do with my life. But then, as I looked at it more carefully, as I grew into it, small pieces at a time, my eyes were open to see that this word is one that changes who we are. It's one that tells us of God's love and grace for our lives. It is a living word in our life, and so my eyes were open to that. Worship was like that too, I have to say. For the longest time, um, I didn't like going to church. My dad would, um, I can't say this, um, he would encourage me. <laughs> See, he's going to be here for Easter, so. Uh, what they call, you know, uh, fact checking and uh, real news. Sure, it's right. Because he literally wouldn't say he forced me into the car, but I would uh, to go. And so I was blind to the joy of worship, to the beauty of worship, to God being with us in worship, and to music. Um, and in that, then, I had my eyes open over time. So I was no longer blind. But I appreciated what happens here amongst us as we share it together. You see, God's grace comes to us and is at work all the time. God's grace comes, <coughs> grace upon grace, for which we do not earn or deserve, for which when it happens to us, when Jesus is present with us, our eyes are open. Right? Our eyes are open to God's love, and we see things more clearly. So today, our one prayer for our worship together, is that Jesus would open our eyes. Open our eyes, Lord, that we might see these new things, that we might be healed of our blindness, our spiritual blindness. All of this that you heard read in John's uh, Gospel, the ninth chapter, takes place within Jerusalem. He is there on, uh, for the time he came for the Feast of the Tabernacles. Uh, he was teaching in the temple courts, uh, they would go up to the Mount of Olives uh, to stay overnight uh, and be with the disciples. And it is in the chapter 8, right before this, that Jesus makes this I am statement, which John is famous for, right? Jesus says, I am the bread of life, I am living water. And here he says in chapter 8, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. All of this made the Pharisees and everybody else question who Jesus was and why he had come. Not everybody understood it, even the disciples, for which now in this moment Jesus is walking past a blind person. I picked this picture up off the internet and it's of a homeless man whose cardboard sign says, I'm blind and homeless and please help or God help. I don't think that's too unlike maybe what Jesus ran into that day. In our scripture, it says that this man had been blind from birth. And right away, somebody asked him, and I'm always challenging Jesus, says, well, is it the man who sinned or his parents who sinned who caused this illness? And boy, don't we show our blindness when we start to equate a person's, uh, something going on in a person's life to their sinfulness or an illness or a disease or something like that because of that. And Jesus makes it quite clear. He makes it clear. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but Jesus said, this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. You see, sometimes our treatment of those who are not like us, those who are lost, those who have disabilities, those who are uh, on the outside of our circles, exposes our own inability to see. Literally, we become blind to the needs of others. And so there's just a little bit of irony in this when Jesus picks a blind person then to heal. It would be a truth amongst us to believe that God doesn't look for blame. Who's at fault? But he looks to love and out of that love, again, grace upon grace comes so that we might have our eyes open to see again. 
Well, the mud and the miracle. you got to love this, right? Most of you think about a healing taking place and what happens. This great beam, bright white light comes down from the heavens. There's a choir singing behind the whole moment. And a healing takes place, right? The answer is no. Right? But that's how we picture it sometimes, right? It's a holy moment, a sacred moment. Instead, this is very earthy, is it not? I mean, it's very earthy. Jesus spits on the ground. Now, who's thought of Jesus as really spitting a whole lot, right? I mean, my grandpa, he chewed Copenhagen, and he spit a lot. And it was pretty gross. I can't imagine our Lord Jesus spitting. And there he did. He spits on the ground. He reaches down. He, like our children's messing, he mixes the mud and the earth together with the saliva. And he puts a lot of mud on his thumb, I assume. And he reaches out, and the blind man can't see what's going on. And all of a sudden, he feels this wet mud on his eyes, you know, with spit on it. And I think he'd be shocked, right? And then he says to the man, blind man, go, wash in the pool of Siloam. That is an interesting little part of this. Why didn't Jesus just heal him right in that moment? Why didn't he just say, Healed. The guy opens his eyes and goes, whoa! But not. Why does he go through all this trouble? And then says, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. The word Siloam means sent, by the way. And that's somewhat important to us. Because those of us who have our sight to heal are sent. We are sent out to show others what Jesus has done for us. <coughs> So he's washed, he's healed, and he goes home. I want you to picture yourself as you would uh, to be this blind man. Uh, what it is that he must have felt. He's never known sight all his life. He was born uh, blind, and every day of his life he knew the darkness that was there. Never knew the light. Jesus was what the metaphor on the light of the right? And then in this moment, this man stops. He feels now does all of this. What is this man feeling? If there is some hope that you could regain your sight, what would you want? Would you want Jesus to heal you? Would you want to believe every word that he says and trust this to be true? You see, you have to trust. You have to be ready to understand that faith doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to know every aspect of what's going on. In that moment, he didn't ask a question. He simply responded to God's grace in his life, and he went, despite the obstacles. And I think too often for us, we don't see it that way. We see all the obstacles. I mean, how many of you have been at a church meeting? <laughs> right? Well, I don't know if we can do that. I don't know if we have the money for that. I don't know if we have enough volunteers to do that. I don't know if anybody would come. So instead of all the obstacles that sometimes are put before us, in faith we have to sit and go and be ready. Because what God will do then is what is the most important. We don't need to find excuses. We simply need to go. Well, you have to admit that this was not the best day ever, right? Here you are. You are healed as a blind man, right? You pull those slow, you wash, and all of a sudden you open your eyes for the first time, and there's all this color and beauty all the way around you, and you have to go, this is absolutely the best day of my life. And you go back home, and what happens? Everybody questions him, right? You got, uh, you got the neighbors who get around him and say, is this the guy that used to be out front uh, begging for food that you know we give alms to every day? You know, they're questioning him. They don't believe him. And then what does his mom and dad say? Well, he's our son. And he was blind at birth. But uh, he's old enough. You probably have to ask him. Not a lot of support from mom and dad. And then he goes to the Pharisees. Well, thank you very much, Jesus, for healing me today and giving me my sight. But you know what? This is not exactly the celebration I was thinking it was going to be. But look how he answers every one of their questions. Every one of their questions. It's a response of grace. How then were your eyes open? They asked him repeatedly. Right? The Pharisees, the family members, the town people. The man they called 
Jesus, he said, made mud, and he put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam, and I washed it. So I went and washed, and then I could see. How is our witness? I, I think it's hard for us. When we want to tell someone about what Jesus has done in our lives, all of a sudden we get wrapped up in, well, I think I need to know more about the Bible. I have to have some Bible verses to quote. I should, I should, be, I should be more knowledgeable about the Bible. You know what? I should probably learn more about theology. You know what, my Christology is not quite so good, and you know what, I pretty much forgot the entire of the Buddhist law catechism in our church. I don't know if I can tell anybody else about Jesus. But what does he simply do? He simply tells them about what Jesus did for him. Is it fancy language? Is it some deep talk? He said, no. The guy put mud in my eyes and told me to wash, and I did, and it happened. And you see, whenever Jesus is present, God's grace upon grace is for us, and things happen. And we have to be ready for that. What I want to point out to you today is that, like this scripture reading, or what person, and like this sermon, it takes time. It takes time. We think, right now, Lord, let's fix it. Let's make it better. Let's do it right now. But there's a progressive understanding here of not only who Jesus was to the blind man, but also how his spiritual sight was restored. Look at these four verses. Verse 11 says, he replied, made some money, uh, this her day, put some pools along, and washed, and I could see. No statement about who Jesus is. And then the second one is 17. They turn again to the blind man. What have you to say about this? And then he says, well, who do you say that he is? He says, well, he must have been a prophet to do something so incredible. And then 33. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. But he, in fact, did heal him, right? And then his last statement, and our statement for today. Then the man said, Lord, I believe and worship." So where do we come to in our spiritual lives? We have grace upon grace every day. It's a shame how we sometimes don't even see it right before us because we're spiritually blind. Jesus is counting on us to be his presence with others. It's personal. It's human. It's spit and mud. It's the touch of a hand, the welcome of a voice. It's face to face. It's person to person. And you know what? It can get really messy you start dealing with everybody's life, right? One of the joys I had in my previous church was that um, I, I, was, I got to use the Good Samaritan Fund to help people. And, you know, it was really easy just to help people a little bit. You know, uh, a few bags of groceries and uh, something else, and on your way, that was easy. But when you start getting involved in someone's life, it's that, you know, well, where do you live, and, you know, can we help in this way? How can we help you, too, with maybe some education or some training or some skills or language or whatever it was? And when you start to get involved in people's lives, it starts to get messy. But that's exactly where Jesus calls us to be, in and amongst people's lives. Well, I want you to think of this today, too, is that God found you, right? After all the grace that you've experienced in your life, and all the people who question you about whether or not that was true, you finally get to that point where Jesus comes back and finds the man. Finds the man again. And that spiritual blindness that was there, now he can see. You see, we are sent to be present with the lost, rejected, the waiting, and the doubting. The question for us today is this one. Do you believe also? Just like the blind man. Do you believe? Lent is the time. Lent is a time that you can experience that healing in your life. It's a time to open your eyes to others. It's a time to get your spiritual sight back. It's a time to believe and worship the Lord who has brought that healing to your life. Come on Good Friday, my friends, and experience the blindness of death is the winner in all of this. And that's all we can see is the darkness of that day. And then, Come experience the eye-opening resurrection in the morning when the light of the world is amongst us again. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing.